Evening, everybody. Um, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, we're here uh, to launch um, Virginia Astley's uh, book, The English River. Uh, I'm sure everybody that's that, that's here at the front is a big enough fan to, to know uh, plenty about Virginia, so I won't sort of bore everyone with the, the kind of potted bio. Um, for anyone at the back who's umming and ahhing about whether to stay or not, Virginia's a acclaimed songwriter and musician um, at, in, a, in a kind of past life but 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 still occupies those places and and also now um, a wonderfully accomplished poet and um, last week I think was it last week the book came out last Thursday no, it was, it was actually the end of June. oh in the June yeah, yeah. Um, published uh, her first book with with blood axe um, full-length collection of poetry uh, and, and some poems uh, and some photographs um, and she's going to be reading from this book uh, first and then we're going to have a, a, a bit of a Q&A afterwards and then there'll be some time for questions at the end. So without further ado I'll uh, introduce the star of the show, Virginia Astley. just saying to Will, I'm, I'm quite used to reading my poems with my daughter Florence playing a harp, so it's kind of, I feel quite nervous being on my own, a bit exposed. So anyway, um, this collection came about as a result of um, attempting to write a prose book about the Thames, and in particular about the lock keepers and the people who worked on the river. And as I'd grown up on the Thames, I wanted to go back and see if they were still there in their lock houses. And this was about seven years ago, about 2011. And I found that they were, but they were under a threat from the Environment Agency, who had great plans to make one lock keeper cover lots of locks and rent out the idyllic cottages for premium rents. Luckily, this plan went wrong. Um, but at the point I started the journey, this is what was, was happening. The first lock keeper I spoke to was a man called John, at a lock called Buscott Lock, which is the second lock down on the Thames. There's 45 locks on the river, and the river flows from the source up near, well, sort of the middle of nowhere, really, in Gloucestershire. Um, Kemble is the nearest village, all the way, as you all know, down to uh, here and the sea. So I'm going to start in the right place at the source. Source. There is time before dark to walk by tangled willow herb next to the rail track. Until, out in the open, we wade through hems of pale wheat down to the valley floor. And our shadows stretching in late light follow every meander, every tussock to the edge of the meadow, where, in the shade of a wood, while a yellowed ribbon unwraps itself, a small cairn and something like a gravestone wait. The Conservators of the River Thames, 1857 to 1974. This stone was placed here to mark the source. Today there is a gentle dip, an inflection in earth, no water. Late sun gilds the wheat, ignites grey-green lichen on dry stone walls. From far across the valley, the train's two notes. And this particular place, the source, has been written about. As I was writing my book, I was looking at old literature, and there was a lovely man called W. Senior who was writing in the 1800s who described the grove resounding with birdsong set in the rapturous key of the bridal season. <laughs> that was brilliant. Anyway, so we go a little bit further from the source and um, go through the places like Cricklade, where the river starts to become navigable for small rowing boats and kayaks. And a little bit further on at Lechlade, the river is now fully navigable. And at one time, this was a major centre for barges. And this next poem is called Brandy Island, and it features a man called Robert Tertius Campbell, 
who came back from Australia having made his money in gold with very, very big plans. He decided that he wanted to um, have the most highly industrialised farm in the country. And basically he set about doing that. And as one of his major features, he was going to grow sugar beet and distill it to spirit alcohol to sell to the French for brandy. So this is Brandy Island. How it must have looked in 1870. This place thundering with industry, the mill, the reservoir, water wheels, even a light railway and the telegraph. The fields thick spread with night soil yielding acres of sugar beet, distilled to alcohol and sold to the French for brandy, two shillings and sixpence a gallon. Today, all by itself is a concrete barn. So little to show for Campbell's enterprise. The river lies still, milky green, above the island rooks cackle from their nests. Air congests with the dank of leaf mould. Gates are barricaded, shut with signs that shout, this is a multi-hazardous site, keep out. And as you can see from the photo in the book, it is, there's not really very much there now. So, but back in the day, there was this enormous great factory. There was so much going on there. And next to Brandy Island is the lovely Lock Buscot, the second lock, where the man I first met, who helped me enormously on this whole journey and put me in touch with other lock keepers, John, was working as a lock keeper. And this poem is about him, Buscot. Weir, pool, lock, and a cottage with water on three sides, and a fish pound instead of a cellar. And just upstream, an older tree, its roots half in, half out the water, home of the blue-bordered carpet moth. This is a place of water and sky, where the river's rising is everything, where the willow coming to drink lets its chains of leaves dip, and the reed sweet grass bows in prayer, where one man whittles his years. A man who has learnt the water's rising winds out his weir, keeping count by kicking stones from his carefully placed line. Who, as the night sky swarms with stars, Hearing voices from his weir, pictures one day in a hot July, when the hazelnuts are forming, how he'll cross the island, watch Chubb lazing in the stream. And that, that's, that's true that John does always hear voices in his weir, and um, I think all lock keepers are very attached to their weirs, they always say, my weir. So, and the weirs are very different too. Each weir has different kind of weirs and different operations, and it is a dark art. It's something that people just learn over years, and the information and experience is passed on by word of mouth. So I think we'll um, go a little bit further. So on my journey down the river, because I was wanting to really experience things, I. I was talking to the lock keepers and then I started to think, well, I'm just, all my information is second hand. It's not really my own experience, apart from the fact that I grew up on the river, so things were familiar. And um, I went online and there was a job advertised with the Environment Agency as a lock keeper summer assistant. These jobs no longer exist, it's now you have to volunteer so you don't get paid. But the year I did it, and the following year I did it, um, 2012 and 2013, and in 2012 I was a lock keeper's assistant based at Benson, and 2012, you may not remember, but it was the wettest summer. It was like that 180 degrees from this, it was the wettest summer ever, it was so unbelievably wet, and the water was so high that lots and lots of boats didn't really travel on the river at all, they were not allowed to travel, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't safe. And when I first arrived at Benson Lock, and there's a photo in the book of Benson Lock, this weir, you know, this is normally, this is a summer's day. This um, weir is, well, that's just, that's just normally like flat. 
so it was wild. So I thought, oh no, I'm never, I could hardly even cross over the weir, let alone, you know, think about working there. It was terrifying. The weir at Benson. The white noise flanged and phased, filtered as the wind changed, and there were other sounds, far off, voices carrying, while from upriver the water bore gorging down, almost solid, its khaki green cleaving the reeds, still smooth and briefly clear, as it plunged the first step of weir, before breaking on the next, whitening with each to the churning pool. Mottled, frothing with eddies spooling, the undertow sucking, regurgitating, charging the air with a fresh spinach smell. Rocks cackled and kites paused in this space above. The other thing I found working on the river was that so many things that I thought I'd left behind and memories kind of resurfaced. And quite a lot of these were quite sad. Um, but I'm just going to read one now called I breathe as though I've been submerged and I'm coming up for air. Even from here the bells can be heard falling apart as they ring a plain hunt. The treble and tenor chiming together, not bothering the cows grazing the river's edge. And high on the downs I pause. Look back over the river valley, its broad expansive fields interrupted by the cooling towers of the power station. The strange familiarity and comfort of their hyperboloid structures always helping you place exactly where you are. Clouds gather above the undulating sweep of barley and wheat, ripening despite this rain. So few boundaries, no hedges, no woods, only fields glazed in filmic light. And this is my remembered landscape, stored in my earliest self. And all along I have been rewinding, replaying, continuing this quiet exchange. The one other thing that got um, cancelled that year was the annual Swan Upping, where the livery companies, the Vinters and Dyers, go upriver from Surrey all the way up to Abingdon, catching the swans and counting them. And they do this, I mean, originally it was tradition, but now there's a very much an educational and um, health of the swans side to this, where they're checking on swan flu and how, how swan numbers are doing. But because of the rain and the high river, they couldn't do it that year. And so the first time it was cancelled in 500 years, but I went back the following year. Swan Upper. First thing, I returned to the river where last night, as swans regained possession, you tied your skiff, Rosalind, alongside the other five outside the beetle, and using those boats as stepping stones, as a man who works on water would, you came to me. But yours is the tideway, with its chronicle of springs and neaps, its ebb and flood and clinging fog. You sense the moon exact her pull, you lick the salt on an east wind. But now you've pulled ashore in our quiet reach, a four-day row from stains for the royal vintners, dyers, swan-uppers, boat builders, tugboat drivers, a rowing coach, and David, the queen's swan marker, his hat embellished by a quill. Trailed by an entourage of vintage boats with their perfect paint work and ice buckets, out for a week-long booze up while you catch and count swans. No one about this early, but last night you, Thames Waterman, master of the Woolwich Ferry, in your red t-shirt and white trousers half masked, with your sockless ankles and pumps with no latest laces, your dark curls wilting. You came to me. Um, how much longer will? <laughs> how much more can you stand? <laughs> Ten more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, where should we get to? Um, so as I was saying, um, I generally read most for to cleave. 
Um, this poem um, relates to an incident which, um, when, I, when I did many, many years ago, when I did my album from Gardens Where We Feel Secure, this poem is pretty much like me remembering, remembering. Moles for to cleave. Hemp agrimony, angelica, willow herb, insist their names are read aloud. A towpath recitative, half said, half sung, as the river sleeps, curls into a backwater. On this, the longest reach without a lock. Where there were always dairy cows, their turgid udders swaying as they grazed their way alongside the water. And you must remember those sultry afternoons, how they'd wade in and with their legs half immersed, lower their heads to drink, flies pestering. And those fields beyond, how they blazed that time, the wind bellowed the stubble fire, and hearing a siren score the night air, we opened the door to watch, flames taking hold, blow torching the hill. Now I'm going to read, how did I ever think this would be okay? Here we all are at the wedding party. Your sister has married my ex, the one I left for you. This winter's afternoon they married in that same Riverside church. Your sister, pale and gorgeous, Russell in his kilt. His mother and sisters are here too, downing rum punch in the lounge. They seem to be avoiding me, possibly because I was the one who slung his bass guitar into the Thames. But that was before you and I were, before London and Liverpool, before Oxford and Monmouthshire. But the last time I was in this house, I can hardly speak, was the day we buried you. And I remember your father, who'd never bought your records, breaking down in Tower Records. And that day, your poor body, the only thing the same, your hands. And, um, what should I read now? Maybe Night Rain. Night Rain. In the darkness, you lie awake, hearing the front panes fret. Sensing static travelling the valley until white noise surrounds the house and gutters and culverts overspill. And if you didn't live in this village and hadn't all these neighbours, perhaps you would tiptoe downstairs to lie naked on the soaked grass, recall the constellation of swimming underwater. You remember the old weir, Clear water plunging over a willow bough, lodged so long it had sprouted, and notes of eglantine, like sweet apples, hanging in the ionised air. So working on the, um, the lock side, there are lots of things that fall in the locks, not just people. And uh, this is a poem about all the things that are lost, or some of the things that are lost in locks. Lost in locks. This is all completely true. <laughs> you muster the hitcher pole and struggle to free the older bowl, washed downstream and wedged in the lock gates, until, distracted by a boater, you allow the pole to sink and sink. And now, as the water wavers, you gaze down, recalling the hoe you lost last week at Cleve. Imagining a trail of lost garden implements. But it's not only them. Gerard's glasses went e in last week at Benson, and yesterday, early, before the boat has arrived, you stood indicating the spot where his rower's camera was last sighted the previous evening, while Roe, Ray, keeper at Osney, flung his magnet on a line again and again, but nothing ever came up. One day, all of this, the river's collective unconscious, might lie in museum shells, like the Roman sword dredged all those years ago at Shifford, now behind glass, immaculate in the Ashmolean. As for Windsor Old Weir, it's seen no salmon these past two decades, but that hot summer when river levels were low, 
a motorbike was glimpse. And best of all was when they drained Penton Hook and at the bottom found waiting, lopsided in the mud, a piano. Completely true. <laughs> um, and just a couple more and I'll finish. So, uh, oh, Marble Hill Park, or let's have a look. No, I'll read one about more local to here. Whopping, whopping one. So, um, my very first record company was in Wapping. And uh, in those days, well, it's still pretty unchanged now, isn't it? It's still all cobbly and old. But um, then it, it, it was um, very, um, it was the first building, I think, that was, had been converted from a wharf. Well, it maybe probably wasn't the first, I'm completely exaggerating. But anyway, disappearance. I see you back in that street in Wapping, the cobbles, the peeling paint, shadows on your young face, your slim hands clenched, air reeking of damp clothes, like now it was November. I think of you on Sundays, years of family lunches, how you never spoke, and how afterwards from far away I'd hear you play. Was it always Chopin? And I wonder where his fantasy impromptu took you because as your fingers began to improvise, the descending shape, let's not call it a melody, more a downward unravelling, matched the tightening in my chest. November. You walked fast, your designer coat flaring as you slipped between the wharfs, vanishing down the waterman's stairs, the water glinting like the pewter of an Elizabethan bar. And to finish, I'm going to read, I think, Homecoming. Which is how it always feels, go back, go back to the river. Homecoming. When it is grim and you've forgotten how to go on, and it rains in a way you no longer recognise, you stand again in the strange ambivalence of a place you loved, where no one loved, and where, left to get on with it, your withdrawal grew, until you lived in a world of hedgerows and open fields filled with the whistle of starlings, of chalk banks and beech woods, where last thing the little owl would call to anyone still awake. And on the path you tracked across the seasons, heard the chiff chaff, saw the swallow take the river's bend. You feel time spiralling until you stand on the bank, watching the leaving geese flying low, understanding you are on your own. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for that, Virginia, the wonderful reading. Um, so we're just going to have a, a, a bit of a chat about the um, various processes that have gone into making this book. Um, and, um, and then we'll, we'll have some questions as well from, from, from you guys who I'm sure have, have got them. Um, maybe, maybe a good place to start is you were saying that you normally read with your daughter playing harp and flute, I think she plays? I, well, I well, play you, the flute, yeah. She plays the harp. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, maybe it'd be a good place to start if we talked about how your musical um, past or your, 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 your sense of music has fed into writing poems or, or prose, actually, um, and whether you think they're, they're linked in any way or, or yeah. they're completely separate. No, I think they're very linked. I think that they are, are kind of hybrid versions of the same thing, songs and poems. I feel that um, it certainly feels like I'm using the same bit of me if I'm writing a song or a piece of music or a poem. And, uh, and the, there are references in, in the poems, aren't there? You know, I'm thinking of um, the first three lines of, of The Weir at Benson, which you, you, um, you read. Uh, flanged and phased. Uh, do, you, do they come out? Do those sort of references come out completely naturally, or is it something that you you feel like you, ha you 
Um, well, I think I always think of the weir as being like white noise, and then so I'm thinking that, yes, that the, the, the effects of the wind or the effects of where you're walking or the voices carrying over, all of those things sound like, yeah, you could be in a studio or sitting at home, whatever, just, you know, altering, altering a basic sound in some yeah. kind of way. Yeah, and so the, the, does the poem, uh, the idea of the poem exist as a, a sound for you before it has meaning in a kind of, on a sentence level, or, or is it, do the, the, the two things kind of feed in, into each other, or does, does the sentence come first and then you mould it until the sound is right? Um, I think, for me, it's always the feeling that comes first. So I'm, um, but I'm also always taking notes. So even if it's just on my phone, or I'm using my phone to take photos, I'm always sort of recording things. But I'm thinking, oh, I can use that, I'll use that, oh, I like that, I like that. So I'm always storing stuff. Um, and then how it actually then ends up coming out is um, not necessarily the you know the same time or as or in the same or in the way that I imagine necessarily. I don't think I've quite answered that. No, that, that that was fine. So I mean, but let's talk about the photos because um, it it they kind of um, they have quite a profound effects on uh, the the artifact of this book really, don't they? They've sort of they've changed the shape of the white space on the page um and w which obviously as a poet is you know it, 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 as important as the the, the the black marks of the words but how how did it come about for you that the photography and i don't know if everybody's seen a copy of the book there there are for sale at the, uh, at the at the front of the store but um there are these wonderful photographs throughout the book so could you talk a little bit about how that works? Yes. Um, uh, well, I was primarily taking the photos as a way of remembering the river when I wasn't there so that I would be able to write my prose book about the river. And then um, and I just had lots and lots of photos. And um, then I, I had all my prose and then I had the poems as like little suitcases that punctuated the prose and each bit of each section I would unwrap the poem and write about at length what I, the poem was about. And then a couple of years ago I thought, oh, I'm going to try taking all the poems out and all the photos and putting them together. Well, the photos weren't in the book, just selecting photos from my big mass of photos. And then, um, and then, and then it seemed to work. So that's how the book came about. It, in a way, it was kind of like a default thing. It, it, the only thing is, it's it's all landscape that's so kind of familiar to me, um, and even even I hadn't even really registered until recently that how it's the same territory of From Gardens where we feel secure of that particular album. So it's as though I'm kind of it's like I'm the person who's only got one song. You know, it's like every it's the same it's the same area. It's all the same stuff. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Robert. Valser or Walser, I can never pr pronounce it right or, or know how to pronounce it right. He, he says that he, he, he'd like to think of his body of work as an endless, plotless book that is more or less the story of his life. So I think, you know, I think you're allowed to retread that ground. Um, but, but perhaps we could talk a little bit about that w without veering too much into the territory of kind of biography. Um, Outside of the poems, now that we're, we're talking, I mean, w w how exactly does the river, did the river feature in your life? Where, where particularly did you have this relationship with the river? How has it figured in other aspects of your life and, and, and how does it continue to haunt you, maybe? Um, well, I think I've very often lived by the river, even if I hadn't sort of registered, or even like I was saying, my first record company being at Wapping, and it was Metropolitan Wharf, and literally, the doors opened onto the river, and I was living in Pimlico by the river. I lived in Twickenham, you know, near the river. I grew up in Oxfordshire near the river. So it it was a it was a reoccurring theme without me kind of realising it. And um, but I think there was something about always feeling this um, 
I didn't I didn't read the poem Watermarked, but there's something about um, always returning to the river and the sense of standing by the river and what that does to 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 many of us, you know, particularly a place that that, that is, is that we feel very very attached to. Um, it, it, it's a, it, it's very kind of like I, I can't really explain it, um, but it was something that I realised was always there, even though I hadn't actually kind of fully registered it until I started writing. So, so the writing process kind of became a way of thinking as well as thinking, yeah. becoming writing. Yeah, yeah. In, in, interesting. And do you think it's um, you know the title is the English River, which is you know it, it's specific um it, it, blood, blood axis title well, oh, it, oh is it um, i like it but it wasn't yeah. my invention okay <laughs> uh, well maybe i'll have a chat with neil sometime and, and, and bring, bring it up with him but um the, yeah the, uh, i was quite interested in this idea of, because obviously they, they, they are quite english poems they're, they are specific to a place you know I, as a reader, I, I know the place, so so it's it, it has that double kind of power. Um, but I wondered what it meant to you, the idea of the English River, but you've now answered and said it wasn't your title, so maybe that's not a good question. <laughs> well, it's a funny thing too, because I think when I was young, and, and you know, in reviews and things, and people would always, would always say, God, about the Englishness of my music, and I used to hate that, I used to hate it. But actually, I don't mind now. I think, oh, well, you know. <laughs> But I, th I think there's something that, that that's quite current about the idea of um, celebrating the, the particular in it, as a kind of refusal of a, a, a kind of tyrannical globalism um, that, that that appealed to me about about that title anyway. But um, the the other aspect I thought was interesting about the the book. Um, is I mean, while we're talking about landscape and, and what is a, a, a bit of a vogue for landscape writing, nature writing, what, whichever term you might you might use, um, th this book has a particular um, or particularly well wrought aspect of, of, of the personal. You know, there's this there's this element throughout of somebody that you're addressing. Um, love affair or love affairs that that seem to be, um, you know, in the peripheral view of the of the speaker of the poems, very affecting um, it, it throughout, um, and it's quite an interesting um, t tool, I suppose, to, to 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 these poems, which could e which could easily, without that element, have just sort of slid into pastoral. Um, uh, kind of poetry. Uh, I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about that and how that power worked. I think that's the way I way I write really is that I think I write to work things out. I walk to work things out and I write to work things out. So in a way I'm not really thinking necessarily of the end product and I was the same writing songs. But, you know and I think actually uh, many of my songs are deeply deeply personal but I never kind of felt um, that, that I was exposing myself because I always thought, oh, I'll just put masses of echo on and no one will be able to make out the words. No, <laughs> you can't really do that with poems and it's all really clear in the print. You can get them all smudged. No. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is. It is it's my way of, of working things out a lot of the time. Yeah, uh, well, I think it's a, you know, a, a really strong element to this. To this body of work, I think, and, and, and it does move it into a, an area that's quite different to a lot of that almost humanless writing about place, which is, which occurs with this sort of slightly nondescript, normally male who goes for a walk and writes about you know the hills, uh, and these poems have a particular flavour because of that. Yeah, yeah, I think. Um I mean, sometimes I worry that I'm too much like that. I worry that it's, you know, that I'm too much. <laughs> it's too much about me, but, you know. In a way, what what is the landscape without the human in the landscape? Yeah, and the, also you know. we all resonate with each other, don't we? You know, it's a common experience. You know, you, you write something and it touches somebody else or their experience as well. Yeah. 
Per perfectly put. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm, I, I wanted to make sure that anyone with any questions can, can ask, so maybe we could open it up and then uh, Virginia will be signing obviously the new book uh, and, uh, and, and, and any old um, bits and bobs that people may or may not have brought along. Um, uh, so, so are there any questions uh, out there? I did, yeah. What kind of phone did you use? Um, oh, just my iPhone, like an early iPhone. Um, yeah. Yeah, and some, some I did with my camera, which isn't a very particularly flash camera, um, but, but most were with my phone, yeah. And I wasn't really trying to take great photos. I was more, as I was saying before, just, just literally trying to record the landscape and remember it. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Sorry? Amazing. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I was going to say, I remember um, when you were interviewed with, um, what was his name? But, um, you were talking about the music and how um, when, when you were travelling down the river that, that obviously it reminded you of the From Gardens I'm just wondering whether you might have thought I might take some recordings as well, or is that something that might, you might think about later? Because people will inevitably think, you know, of a second type of album, but obviously a very different. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I was doing, and yeah. I did, and I did do some recordings, and um, borrowed with a smaller recording. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> than a euro. Yeah. Um, and and I do intend to do that to go back. Mm to that, um, and I didn't really get anything that was particularly great, in, but I still have got ideas for, yeah, the same territory <laughs> yeah. at night, or something, you know, whatever. <laughs> Underwater, I think. <laughs> it's the gloves of carp. <laughs> That's a wonderful phrase, actually. <laughs> uh, there was another one just behind. Um, well, there was, there were other people's poems, so like Futility, Wilfred Owen, and Had I the Heavens, Yeats. Um, so yeah, good poets, <laughs> good poems, <laughs> but no, I don't think any, any of mine did, no. <laughs> yep. And you wanted if what, sorry? Oh, um, I think, yeah, I think Hardy is probably an influence. Um, I, was, I was there last night, actually, at Max Gate, till quite late. And I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, I mean, there's just such a, a wealth of, of poetry there. Um, so how, I don't know how, there's nothing really that's very conscious where I go, oh, I'm going to try and do that. But I think just by being there and the amount I've read while I've been there, um, just definitely, I'm sure, well, and being, when I was the writer in residence at Hardy's Cottage in the autumn too, and walking all the time in that landscape, um, I think it, it does, yeah, it, I'm, sure it, I'm sure it has some kind of um, subliminal or more than subliminal influence, yeah. <laughs> Any more? Questions? Yeah, uh, oh, as a book. Um, no, no, no. I mean, I think I, I'm thinking about um, more revisiting it and um, having getting some of the songs sung. The, the, um, in Dorchester, near where I live, the, there's um, the new Hardy Players who do kind of hardy productions each year. And I was thinking about maybe getting some kind of small version of the Woodlanders put on by some of them, perhaps at Max Gate or at Hardy's Cottage, or out in the woods. Better still. <laughs> yeah, one more. Yes, I am, Rob, yes, definitely. I mean, I'm really, really hoping that by having this 
poetry book out that maybe I can uh, find a publisher who, who would be interested in in the whole in the whole book. Um, yeah, so I am. Yes. <laughs> If there's no more questions, then we'll, um, we'll, we'll we'll wrap up and let Virginia sign some stuff mm -hmm. for you. Um, any more? No? Okay, well, in that case, I'll just um, let you all thank Virginia again. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Virginia Ashley. Thank you. Congratulations, thank you. Virginia. Thank you, yeah. thank you.